All right, welcome uh, back to this uh, last section today of the Bergen Exchanges uh, program. And I would like to welcome everyone digitally present and uh, the few of us physically present. There are actually a few people actually attending physically as well behind the camera. But on stage here, there are just two of us, but please relax. There are more people with us present digitally. I would like, first of all, to thank the uh, Center on Law and Social Transformation, the Law Transform, for organizing the Bergen Exchanges. It is a fantastic opportunity to engage on large and broad issues like we have here today. I would also like to thank the people at the Bergen Global who do a lot of the organizing here as well. My name is Björn Enge Bertelsen, and I'm the uh, leader of uh, the Global Research Program on Inequality, which is a research program set up at the University of Bergen and co-hosted by the University of Bergen and the International Science Council. Now, the roundtable that we have assembled here today represents a diversity of critical perspectives on what knowledge is or perhaps we should rephrase on what knowledge may be. Being an anthropologist, I'm of course quite familiar with a diversity of perspectives, having worked in Mozambique for a number of years uh, and having worked with epistemologies, ontologies, phenomenologies of knowledge, all these issues. But what we want to focus on here today is not anthropology and our sort of carnival of knowledges and epistemologies in a sense, although we can do that as well. We want to focus on the number of movements that have emerged the last few years, somewhat outside academia and somewhat inside academia, aiming to rethink, to probe deeply and critically, knowledge regimes, epistemic traditions, and the nature of academic practice. Such movements, often in the form of protests, have also called for rethinking the very institution of the university. And related to that, it has probed very often the problem of long-standing hegemonies of knowledge and academic hierarchies, for instance. And some critics like, for example, South Africa-based scholar Sabelo Nodlovo Gacieni has called for epistemic liberation, that is, a liberation of what the episteme or epistemology is. But how does one go about undertaking such liberation? What for, would, for instance, the role of law and legal practices be in addressing such knowledge inequalities and new institutional arrangements? Is there a role for law and legal uh, practices? In this roundtable, we will go into these quite thorny and sometimes quite controversial issues. And I'm extremely lucky to have with me a number of scholars within the field. And I thought a good way into this would be for them to present uh, their response, their reflections, their interventions on these issues as a way to start us off and then go into a broader debate and then open the floor, digital floor, here and uh, actual floor here uh, for questions. So I think we can start with Temi uh, Odomusu. Now, Temi, uh, that you should be able to see on the screen, nice to see here uh, in front of me, is a senior lecturer in cultural studies at Malmö University. She is the author of the book Africans in the English Caricature, 1769 to 1819, Black Jokes, White Humor. And her research and curatorial practices are concerned with colonial archives, archiving, slavery and visuality, race and visual coding in popular culture, post-colonial art and performance, image ethics and the polit politics of digitization. So she might be also working on the very format that we are using here, but we might hear about that. Overall, she's focused on the ways art can mediate social transformation and healing. So, Temi, the digital floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the invitation to participate in this streamed gathering of scholars. I, I kind of feel a little bit out of place because I'm really an artistic researcher uh, slash art historian and um, 
my dabblings with law and, and legal thought, um, well, they come and go in bits and pieces. But I thought I would just uh, present from where I stand as the most authentic way. Can I share a slide? Is that possible? I think so. Uh, <laughs> I'm, not, uh, I'm not sure. Okay, let's see if I can do that. If let's not, then no problem. If it works. Yes, it should work. You should be looking at a window. Fantastic, yes. Okay, so um, I am, um, I'm, I'm many things, but really I'm an educator, I'm a teacher. Um, I, I spend my time uh, teaching students right now at Malmo University around visual communication, um, cultural studies and, 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 and issues of representation but also the specifics of uh, photography and, and, um, and also understanding how space and place and memory and archive kind of work together. Um, I spend a lot of time uh, in museums and cultural institutions that, that uh, are very weighty uh, and carry many things that help to, to demonstrate uh, the way coloniality works. Um, I'm also a curator um, and often I get called on to speak publicly about the things that I have found and I, I, I and because of my curatorial practice which is both historical and also contemporary I get to collaborate with artists but what I have here in front of you is um, a, a photograph uh, from an intervention that I made while I was on a curatorial residency um, in a program at Botchirka Konstal, which is an art space just in the suburbs of Stockholm. Uh, and Botchirka municipality is well known in Sweden for many reasons, but primarily because it's the uh, suburb with the most uh, diverse community and often is associated with crime uh, and, and uh, other immigration and integration issues, at least in popular um, uh, news media. So this apartment that is connected to the Konstal um, is situated in Fitia, which is um, the housing community um, that um, is, has this kind of uh, um, reputation in the Swedish media as being a, a challenging environment because of the so many different communities that live there. So I was asked to come and live in this community and then find ways to interact and to share my uh, knowledge, to share my experience, as well as curate a small exhibition. And when I got there, I realized very quickly that it would be disingenuous of me to think that a week or two weeks spent in this place would mean that I had truly collaborated or participated or engaged in this community. So it got me thinking about what are the ways in which we can signal to a community that might not even really care much about the arts or, or the issues that I deal with personally, how might I signal to the community that I was there and that there might be something interesting to talk about with me. And so I decided to do a, um, a talk, which I often give in universities, but this time it was a silent lecture in which I didn't speak, but I projected images from my research through the kitchen window. And you do this by using a technique where you cover the window in, uh, in uh, sour milk. Anyway, long story. Um, but this, um, this intervention I got to thinking uh, enabled me to, to ask questions about what is it, what might I know that may be of value to this community here? Is it the research that I'm doing on colonial image making? Is it the things that I have studied? Or is it just my experience? How did the question of how did I get here to begin with? But I wanted to leave that as a sort of open possibility, but using the images as a way to, to call people. So the lecture happened through the window and then I opened my front door and welcomed the community to come and, and speak with me. So I really present this as a kind of opening for thinking about when we're talking about knowledge inequalities and, and what decoloniality and approach uh, in the academy might be. I think about it very practically in terms of um, shifting the balance of power uh, and finding ways to, to reach out to make um, teaching worlds and experiences vibrant and, and interesting um, 
and to make theory, as Bell Hooks says, a practice um, rather than something that um, um, makes people feel alienated. Um, so in this sense, it's very much about um, finding ways to communicate in the clearest way possible um, to different kinds of audiences and then see what happens. So that's my initial intervention, I think, into this discussion. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Temi. I, I really appreciate the uh, interventionist uh, introduction to this theme. And I also appreciate how you, um, using bell hooks or reflecting bell hooks, uh, uh, talk about theory as, uh, as, as practice. Um, and also, in, in a way, you then open up how we can work and also what institutions we should relate to when we um, talk and think about decolonization, not just university, but cultural institutions as well, like museums, etc. So I really appreciate that. And I think this leads us uh, naturally onto perhaps uh, Divine Fu uh, at the University of, of uh, Cape Town, because Divine Fu, even though he's an anthropologist and, I, uh, uh, and has worked on African cities for extended periods of time, looking at this issues such as agency, dignity and becoming among the non-privileged inhabitants of those cities. Recently, Divine has set up something called Huma, or Huma Institute for Humanities in Africa at, at the University of Cape Town, a very exciting and cross-disciplinary Africa-based humanities initiative. So I think Divine would be, uh, it would be very interesting to hear Divine's intervention into the same kind of field on decolonizing uh, the academy, uh, given this background. And also, I have to say, Divine has also set up uh, being the co-founder and also the co-editor of Corona Times, a very critically and empirically based uh, uh, site, uh, providing really necessary correctives and critiques in this pandemic. So, Divine, uh, please, we're interested to hear what you have to say. Uh, thank you, uh, Bjorn, and uh, uh, thank you, Temi, also for your intervention and, and colleagues, you know, for being here and for inviting us to this uh, discussion. Uh, I, I should start by saying that uh, I am just relaunching Huma, uh, the Institute for the Humanities. It was founded in 2010, the University of Cape Town as an interdisciplinary institute by uh, uh, then the first director, Deborah Pozo. Um, and for the past two years or so, there's been a transition. Uh, and on my return from Kodesria, I was asked to direct this institute and give it a new life. So it's an exciting place. And uh, we're hoping that uh, we will all be meeting there or speaking from there uh, as uh, an injection uh, to this transformative discussion about decolonization. Uh, that we're having, that the next time we uh, uh, have uh, Bergen days, we would have it at uh, a UCT at Cape Town or in Dakar, uh, instead of having it somewhere uh, in, in Bergen. And, and I think that's uh, the issue here. Uh, the, the issue is how we move to a point where we can actually stop talking about decolonization. And that's the point. Uh, why should we spend uh, more than 60 years, this, this year, 2020, many countries on this continent will be commemorating 60 years of independence. 60 years of independence, we are still talking about this decolonization. It's still part of our discourse. I mean, th this should be a problem uh, uh, to all of us. It should be an issue to all of us. Uh, and I think this challenge is how we move to the point where we actually stop talking about it, where we can actually focus uh, on just being, you know, focus on being and rather than focus on explaining ourselves. And I, and I think this is uh, a key issue of all emancipation movement. I, I think uh, we may understand this better uh, than, than anyone else. You know, where do we get to a point where uh, as a woman, you stop explaining yourself? Where do you get to a point where 
you know, uh, uh, as, as, a, as a gay person, you stop explaining yourself that you, you just live life like every, everyone else. And, and, and this is the crux, you know, uh, because to talk about viruses, you know, we, we have been infected by a virus. Uh, and this virus, like uh, uh, a COVID and like HIV, writes, it coats itself into your body uh, and then turns you into the virus so that it can promote itself. Uh, and then over time you become the virus and the virus becomes you. Uh, and then there is this entanglement. And then the question comes, becomes how do we deal with this virus? How do we deal with this pandemic? This pandemic decolonization that has entangled us, that has made us part of itself. You know, we've become one with this thing. How do we disentangle ourselves? And, and I think that is the key challenge that we have here. And we cannot do it without thinking comprehensively. Because as we know from pandemics now and from these viruses, uh, uh, the, it is always a corpus of illnesses. Uh, and you have to deal with the manifestation of those uh, uh, illnesses, but also to deal with the corpus of those illnesses. So if you focus on solving the headache, then you have to deal with the stomach issues, you know? If you focus on sorting the fever, uh, then you have to deal with the consequences of all sorts of other pains. Um, and what has poisoned or what has really uh, dealt a blow with uh, the knowledge system on the continent is something that we really have to deal with uh, comprehensively. And I think uh, the, the problem we really face now is that from, from the 1980s, uh, the structural adjustment uh, measures introduced to the continent, uh, unlike we always think that we're meant mainly to solve economic problems, we're actually meant to destroy the knowledge system on the continent. I think that was the intention. It was intentional to destroy it so that it can never recover. Because once you defund uh, uh, teachers training colleges, when you defund primary schools, when you defund the infrastructure that ensures that a society is produced, that ensures that a system, uh, 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 an independent system is produced, you, you automatically, you know, mess it up. So today, uh, when we think that by building the capacities of PhD students when they are at uh, the university solves the problem, we think that uh, just by doing writing schools or writing uh, retreats, we solve the problem. Or the, that just by taking uh, uh, students out to train them somewhere in Europe and rewrite this thing, we, we solve the problem. We, we have to deal with the comprehensive virus, a pandemic that has really dealt a big blow, uh, you know, to us. And I think that uh, my, what I champion now is uh, what Vignolo and Dabashi uh, are pushing for, for epistemic disobedience, you know, that we, we have to focus continuously on training people who can disobey. Uh, and we should turn disobedience to something that is positive, you know, uh, uh, so that we can push to the link from this system. And as they argue, delinking doesn't necessarily mean that you totally abandon or that the system is bad. It's just that we move to a place where we begin to have conversations with ourselves. But this requires that we look at it comprehensively, that we reconceptualize what we mean by knowledge, that we reconceptualize what we mean by law, for example, that we reconceptualize what we mean by education, that we take it comprehensively. Uh, and I would say, uh, send out a group of knowledge activists whose job it is, uh, is to go about and just create trouble, to make noise, to <laughs> complain, and complain to the point that people keep complaining. As Sarah Ahmad says, you know, a complaint is something that starts, you know, a process um, and helps you to build other solidarity. So I'm pushing for this. Let's move to build a group of complainers, knowledge activists, whose job it is to ensure that we move to this uh, uh, new space. And to conclude uh, this uh, in, uh, introductory remarks, uh, I work in the publishing sector for the, I've worked in the publishing sector for the past years. And I think the publishing infrastructure on this continent is really struggling. Uh, and even where the publishing infrastructure is working, uh, this virus continues to push us to move on 
uh, out to publish outside the continent. So such that even when we produce work on decolonization, we have to take it outside to circulate it. So these kinds of contradictions, I think that we have to uh, deal with. So I, I will end there uh, for my introductory remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Divine. And I, 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 I like the, uh, I really enjoy the, the positive spin, the, the, uh, the need for global uh, epistemic disobedience and knowledge activism. I really do appreciate that. And, uh, and I also share, and I think many of us do, the, the, the aim or hope to, to come to a certain point where the, the very notion of decolonization is not a term we, we relate to anymore. So this is a, uh, this is very uh, optimistic and uh, creative, I think. Um, I think we should move on now to someone who has worked with global epistemologies for a very, very long time, uh, Mozambican scholar Maria Paula Menezes. Uh, she's currently a principal researcher at the Center for Social Studies at the University of Coimbra. And she has focused and published extensively on decolonization processes with a focus on Southern Africa, um, she has also uh, worked, and this might be of particular interest to this roundtable and the audience here, she has worked closely with the Boaventura de Sousa Santos, uh, known of course from, uh, and known for the work of epistemologies of the Global South. So, Paula, the, the floor is yours. We're very interested in hearing what you have to say to us. Thank you all. Thank you, Bjorn, for the invitation. Thank you to my previous colleagues, especially I haven't seen Fu for a long time since last Kodeji meeting. Um, uh, I, I would like to introduce me following a little bit, as Tammy said, uh, my background. I think one of the persons that most influenced me was Akindo Bragança, one of the founding figures of Center for Afri for. African studies at Eduardo Montiano University, my alma mater. And he always called us, you have to think from Mozambique, you have to think from Southern Africa, you have to think from the Indian Ocean. So this is a positionality I always have to refer in order to explain why I'm saying certain things about the world. Also, I think a second element that has a strong influence in a lot of trajectories in the African context, and I'm talking about Angola, Mozambique, Burkina, and so on, is the presence of a strong group of African students that were sent to the then, well, now former Soviet Union and satellite states to produce a new group of intellectuals that would carry out the transformation in Africa. I was part of that generation. And this, I think, are two questions about time and diversity of places that is important when we are talking about the colonization and transformation processes in Africa is to have this diversity in perspective because we indeed we are not a country we are a very diverse continent and these questions have to be brought so I, I, I fully agree that decolonization is a very complicated world it's a world that had different meanings De depending on the context, depending even on positionality regarding what means to decolonize. But this brings me to a question that how far have we gone in decolonizing Europe? Not Africa, but Europe. That's where I work now. And that is a key question. How much has Europe learned from the experiences from the transformation, political transformation in Africa over the last century? And this brings me to the second question. How can we, as Ngungi, Wati Wong, and Pola Tuji claim, can we provincialize history and reworld the theorization of the global history from different perspectives? Uh, so let me get quickly and just to use my six or seven minutes left. I think any imperial project aims to impose institu its institutions and knowledge upon the region that is going to control. And seen from my corner, from my southern eastern African region, I think we have to think about the socialist Eurocentric project and its bequests, the liberal Eurocentric project, and the Indian influence. This is fundamental to understand Eastern Africa and the role of connections across the Indian Ocean. And I think Bjorn, we can later talk about it, but that is 
a fundamental element that would characterize Africa and requires from us to think globalization from a different perspective. So we could uh, start a discussion about the problems of how to rethink world history beyond the Atlantic from the, the, the position of the Indian Ocean. So what, what is there in this territory that is so different from the Atlantic? The second element that I think is very important, and now I'm going back to some of the founding fathers of the political transformations in Africa, it's to understand what they thought to grasp as the key ideas to transform the continent. Quite often we use the names, but as Severin Wang, a philosopher I really appreciate in Mozambique says, we tend to close them in sarcophagus and just use the image and forget about their input, theoretical input. So my question is how much have we learned, for example, from Senghor in terms of its political position beyond the question of the nation state. That is a, for a, a, a foundational element to understand, as Mondrian would say, one of the most perverse colonial bequests, that is the modern nation state. What we have now in the African continent, it's a bequest of, colon of colonialism. It's more than bo borders that are a product of colonial negotiations. And second, we have all the institutionality that it's a product also of this colonial intervention. And those are these are foundational questions that we have to address once we are thinking about redressing education, redressing knowledge, redressing law, redressing justice. This is a fundamental question, for example, to understand Article 4 of the Mozambican Constitution that clearly says that we are a country, a country of legal pluralism, recognizing that there is a diversity of, of legal systems functioning in the country with different levels of complexity. And this opens another box that is very complicated. Once we start challenging the colonial lenses that we tend to use about the continent, that is the colonial lens that normally opposes the modernity of the colonial project to the other project is a traditional and the traditional becomes a single model so we have the modern justice and the traditional justice and my question is that we don't have a traditional justice we have a quite diverse uh, set of institutions and norms that are at use in the country and it requires us to do following um, Foucault an archaeology of knowledge to understand the political structures that existed prior to the arrival of the Portuguese and just a very small reference for example there was an empire in the south of Mozambique the Gaza empire that existed until 1895 and we have to understand what was the role of that empire in constructing a certain projection of Mozambique as a colonial project and why we still have so many people in the north for instance that do not accept the presence of the state so those are questions that still we have to address and those are questions that quite often this modern traditional model does not allow us to grasp profoundly because everything that is on the other side of the line and it's this question of the Sabisa line, of the line that on the other side that is always or of local importance or just uh, a local value of no importance for Europe uh, has to be brought as of global value. And I'm going to give two or three or two small examples just to, to make a, a point. We tend to think that the national states are a big question and we never theorized about it. Senghor has a wonderful work when he talks about the Negritude project. It's a project beyond the nation state. And it's a, a project of refounding the empire on, a, on equal terms. Can we rethink with uh, Senghor beyond Senghor or how can we rethink the continent and the interconnections of the continent with the world? I think those are fundamental elements to go beyond the values that are present in Africa and show its relevance to the world. The second element that I think it's rather important is when we have Nkrumah talking about neocolonialism, 
And for me, Nkrumah was absolutely fundamental to explain to my students here in Portugal when the Troika arrived and there was the economic crisis in 2008 and Portugal and Spain were under this sort of tutelage from the European Union dash European Bank, bank dash uh, World Fund, World Bank. And there was indeed a condition of neocolonialism. But the problem is that neocolonialism seems to be a concept and the reality that only applies to the African continent. And it was very interesting to see that lots of theorizings that we tend to think that only applies to a local can have a much broader global impact. So this is my some of my provocative um, comments that this uh, the, the, the proposal that Bjorn sent us. And I really, my, my last one, it's really a very provocative one. It's the problem of language. Uh, English is not my mother language, nor is Portuguese indeed. I, I have another one. Uh, but we are always forced to speak in English. Uh, this is a challenge that we, in African continent we have to pose because we speak other language, we communicate in other languages, and sometimes the translation is very complicated. Just to give you an example, the other day we were discussing in a small group what is going to be the future. And then we were thinking to ourselves, the concept of future is the same as tomorrow. So it's the time that is going to come. But why do we have this difference in Europe between tomorrow and between the future? And we have to address the logics of capitalism, of colonialism and so on. But it's a really complicated entangled world where we have to start addressing these questions to recognize other forms of knowledge that exist, they continue to exist. And in that sense, that's really my final comment. I think uh, the work of Odero Ruka is absolutely fundamental to go back to it and to think with the Saish people that in our villages think about the world and can be of very strong help for us to co-learn with them what is going to be the tomorrow, the Kusasa of our region. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, uh, Paula, for a fantastically rich intervention. And I think you, you gradually, not gradually, you brought in the, the force of history and uh, the force of histories, you could say, uh, to this debate. I mean, it's very, very important to recognize, of course, histories of colonization, histories that are forgotten, marginalized in the big canons, and the force history uh, exerts on us here today. And you also brought in, of course, the question of the nation state. And I think we'll come back to that yeah, uh, later on. Um, but as a cue into history, we also have actually someone here on stage with me in physical format. And that's Ernesto Seman. And um, Ernesto teaches Latin American history here at the University of Bergen. He's originally from Argentina and has worked on a number of fields relevant for this roundtable, including on populism, on also importantly anti-populism, on neoliberalism, that is also has been referred to both by, by Paula and, and uh, somewhat by Divine, and North American power, in a sense, in its many guises. So, and interesting also in this relation is that he's also worked on the political legacy, you could say, of slavery and the politics of uh, memory and slave monuments and, uh, and the dynamics of protests around these. So, Ernesto, please. Thank you. Um, now, I, I don't know if I got to look at the screen or <laughs> what the real human beings. Um, so I'm going to uh, describe briefly how my work uh, connects uh, with this idea of uh, decolonizing the academy, but I was thinking how strong the connection is, and maybe uh, hopefully we can talk about that later, with what uh, uh, Divine was saying about the um, epistemic disobedience. Uh, I don't know if uh, about stop talking about decolonization, but at least to ask <coughs> uh, uh, why uh, 50, 60, 70 years uh, later, we're still talking about decolonization. Uh, and to what extent uh, one of our challenges is instead how to rescue the, the effort, the intellectual effort uh, of decolonization from more than a half century ago uh, in order to see the new uh, challenges, including why we're still talking about that, um, which is particularly important for historians. You know, for, for 
historians working on Latin American history, uh, the idea of intellectual uh, emancipation and decolonization has one immediate reference, which is Haiti, right? The, the revolution in Haiti and the historical uh, studies developed uh, worldwide, not only in Latin America, <clears throat> uh, since the 1930s, uh, about the end of the 18th century and the Haitian Revolution, the, aboli the abolition of, uh, of slavery. Uh, and it led then to organize world history in a very specific way, recentering the, the Caribbean as the modern uh, experience, as the locus of modernity, uh, uh, the factory, in fact, in which the modern world uh, was, uh, was manufactured. Uh, and this had sort of several implications uh, that shaped historiography and to some extent our understanding uh, of history and, and contemporary Latin America. I think one thing is that the experience of slavery, uh, um, trade and, and consumption uh, became the focus of studies uh, on the production of, of the production of the modern economic system. You no, know, seeing sugar, uh, cotton, coffee uh, trade as the seeds of what we call now, uh, uh, now uh, globalization, and that connected at that time already the Americas, Africa, uh, and Europe uh, at least. But I think on the other hand, these studies located also the Caribbean as the engine that produced modern ideas of freedom, uh, modern, modern ideas of rights, uh, mostly but not only. Uh, uh, around the ways in which the Haitian Revolution uh, sort of forced uh, France and Europe, European powers uh, to, to grapple with the multiple meanings of the ideas of freedom, of equality, and the legal implications of those meanings. It is uh, under these studies mostly uh, the fight of uh, slaves and blacks uh, in the islands in the, in the Caribbean uh, for equality and for freedom, and not the Jacobins uh, uh, in Paris is what radically transformed uh, up to these days uh, and influenced contemporary ideas of rights uh, of individuals and of national sovereignty. <clears throat> so the history of the modern world for, for historians uh, to some extent uh, had one locus that was the plantation, right? Uh, and this conceptualization has been with us for a while, uh, even longer than, than the colonization theories. Uh, and probably one uh, epistemological uh, uh, challenge for historians today is what the plantation means uh, as a sort of a, as a historical artifact uh, in a way that allows us to see what is the plantation today. What are the plantations today? Uh, what are the spheres uh, in which the status quo uh, is being produced materially? Uh, and power around this status quo is being contested from within, discursively and, and politically as well. Um, my work in particular uh, in relation to this is, is the modern production of commodities <coughs> in, in Latin America, uh, as the locus, as, as, as Bjorn was saying, in which uh, neoliberalism is both uh, defined and, and contested. Uh, and as a historical construct, um, the way the plantation was for, for historians uh, in the 1930s, we can see now not only in, in mining, but in the extension of uh, no, soil production, lithium uh, extraction, uh, salmon farming, which is in particular important here in Norway, as these kind of uh, kaleidoscopic uh, objects in which uh, significant parts of the modern life under neoliberalism uh, and, and the meaning of this life is being, is being created. Uh, and it is in, this, uh, in these spaces uh, away from the center, yet intimately uh, related to, to it, were a combination of four uh, different aspects of modern life, modern life uh, is, is happening. One is the discussion about the environmental rights and the extent to which those rights uh, challenge the idea of national, national sovereignty and the idea of the nation, as, as, as Meneses was saying, uh, or challenge the idea of the primacy of property rights over uh, the nation. The discussion about social rights, strongly related to environmental rights uh, and the safety net that characterized uh, um, the welfare state after World War II in, in many parts of the world. Uh, the accelerated liberalization of economic relations taking place uh, since the 1990s and the tensions 
uh, between massive political participation and traditional democratic institutions that are seen now, you know, sometimes as a channel, uh, but many times as an obstacle to this participation, or at least as a target uh, of, of social protest and social unrest. Um, I don't know, there's, there's so many connections uh, uh, with the plantation, uh, but mostly with the decision of, 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 of historian and, histor historians and scholars to sort of uh, rearrange the worldview around these forms of production. But I think there is one connection that I think is crucial and that maybe we can talk uh, about uh, uh, later, and is the relation in, in, in these uh, studies between democracy, human rights, and political violence. Uh, the the events in Latin America, which are public and, and we read about them every day uh, uh, over the last several years, including the military coup, the coup in Brazil, or the political crisis and the coup later in Bolivia, uh, the social unrest uh, in Chile, uh, peasants and students protests in Nicaragua, the protests in the United States uh, lately. They all pose sort of an interesting question about the role of violence in the construction of modern uh, political subjects, uh, which I think we can see uh, from this kind of epistemic disobedience uh, from a less normative uh, perspective, a role uh, the same way we did with slave revolts in the, in the late 18th uh, century, we need to reassess and discuss uh, not only as a threat to, to democracy, but maybe in some fundamental ways as a way to reach it, at least the way it is perceived for, uh, by those who embrace it. So this is basically uh, the way in which I see uh, uh, sort of a productive contribution in, in this idea of uh, epistemic disobedience. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I have with me, uh, I'm very bad at counting, being an anthropologist, but I have with me five, four scholars. Uh, as I said, I'm very bad at counting. Four scholars, very, very oriented towards epistemic disobedience. And this is, uh, this I find uh, very uh, refreshing. But I wanted to, to post the question back to you. And I, I'm, I'm trying to sort of reflect a bit critically on this now, because we can all agree, I think, that yes, academic hierarchies need to be challenged. Yes, there are long lasting connectivities, problematic connectivities between the North and the South related to colonization. Yes, there are institutions uh, established in the global south and the global north that are deeply problematic and that have invisibilized a number of uh, local traditions, local epistemologies, um, etc. This we can agree on. But how far do we want to push this? Huh? I mean, Divine talks about uh, uh, epistemic disobedience. Does that mean as also uh, Temi alluded to, in a sense, inserting noise, epistemic noise, within hegemonic systems, problematic system as a form of exerting critique? Or does it mean, on the other hand, an end to universalism, whatever that might mean? Yeah? How far do we want to push this? Do we want to push it in the direction of, and I might be misinterpreting you, uh, Paula, and I do so on purpose, but does it mean accepting a new form of temporality, for instance, that does not accept the chronology that we have uh, learned with the clock, with industrial work, with the Fordism? Yeah? So how far do we want to push epistemic uh, disobedience, in a sense? This is a question to you, the panel. Anyone would like to uh, respond to that? Temi. I don't know why I'm doing this to myself, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I mean, uh, I, I, you talked about uh, noise, but actually I, I spend quite a lot of my time advocating for silence or at least for quietness. Um, and this also connects to these different uh, understandings or concepts of time. So when I showed this projected image of a young woman called Sarah Forbes Benetta, who was sent to Queen Victoria in the 19th century as a gift, as a quote unquote booty on the spoils of war in what was then known as Dahomey um, from King Gozo, to an English captain, Forbes, from whom she absorbed a name 
on a ship called the Veneta, from whom she also absorbed a name, um, and then is sent to be sort of like educated and turned into a, a, an elegant lady and then photographed. So the photograph is her emerging, appearing um, out of these very complicated um, uh, colonial relationships that were also about, um, I mean, the reason why Captain Forbes was in the home was to encourage King Gozo to stop his participation in the slave trade. And it took a while to negotiate that. But anyway, this woman, uh, Sarah Forbes Benetta, appears in the photographic archive um, and offers us her presence as something to reflect on. So this is how I, I spend much of my time thinking and teaching and also in, in engagement with artists who have what I've described as post-memorial practices and I take this terminology from Marianne Hirsch who writes about the generation of post-memory in the context of Holocaust studies. Um, finding ways to be acutely um, uh, sensitive to and attentive to uh, what has gone before, not as a way to sort of hark and hold on to these these logics, but as, as a way to, to continuously um, not forget um, and remember um, in order to, to sort of um, 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 resituate ourselves differently in the present, which is really also the future. But then also as we look to the future, recognizing, you know, what has come before. So. So these objects and artifacts um, that I use as, as you know, um, um, ways to tell stories are also in, in indicative of ways we might um, think differently about time and space and, and politics and who is involved. Because for me, um, decoloniality or, or decolonizing is about the bod what's happening in the body, on the body, to the body, with the body, between bodies. It's very, it's very personal um, for me, um, um, more so than it is structural and political, though I understand that that is also informing what impacts on my body. So these are, these are um, or our bodies collectively. So, um, so yeah, that's my response, my unwieldy response to your question. Thank you. Yeah. I thought it was very clear. And just just to just to clarify, when I said insert noise, I meant it not in the sense of something that is superfluous or that is uh, that is destructive. I meant it in the Michel Serre sense of the of the parasite. Yeah? Inserting noise as to upset in order to generate something new. So yeah, uh, I think Divine wanted to comment as well. Uh, yes, I. I... I think I'm responsible for this noise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, if if I'm responsible for this noise, is because I I have heard this noise and uh, over and over and over, and also like to make this noise. And also every time we make this noise, we are told that we are making noise. <laughs> yeah, which is uh, which is interesting because it means that. Uh, it is doing something already, you know. The, the fact that uh, I, I recall uh, in, in Edinburgh having a discussion on a panel on knowledge production and um, this professor uh, saying that you should just stop complaining, you know, just stop complaining, you know, let's just do stuff. Yeah, I, I, I enjoy it because the very fact of complaining and that you uh, feel uncomfortable that we're complaining means that it's doing something to you. And, and I think... Uh, uh, this is productive. That's what Sarah Ahmad is doing in her work, as telling us that complaint is really important. Uh, and uh, like uh, Temi is saying, you know, this is embodiment. This, this is about embodiment. And, and I think de decolonization is a cultural project, but it's a project about embodiment. It's a project about this embodiment. You know, how do we uh, uh, embody new ways of seeing. Uh, and that's why I like the notion of, of disobedience or the epistemic uh, disobedience which uh, uh, Mignolo uh, uh, develops and also which the Bashi, you know, builds on. Uh, it is not our responsibility to help others 
who cannot read these ontologies and epistemologies to read. It's, it's, not, it's not our role. What we need to do is to have conversations about uh, ourselves, to help to understand ourselves better, because that's the point of knowledge. Uh, I think we're spending so much time uh, trying to do part of what uh, Maria has, uh, has, has indicated that, you know, Europe needs to be decolonized. It's true. I think that's important, but I don't think it's my problem. You know, uh, I, 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 I think first and foremost, I need to be able to, to commit myself so that I don't do what uh, I think it's um, uh, Francis Nyamjo and uh, Mamdani who talk about imported plants in greenhouses. I have to deal with this issue. You know, I, I, I have, have to find ways first of ensuring that I move out of this potted plant, that I move out of the green, these greenhouses. Why I'm doing that war outside? Um, and part of it is this universalism, which you're talking about. We need to make a lot of noise so that people can understand that there are other ontologies. And that's what uh, Poleno Tonji is talking about, this introversion, this uh, 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 trying to, to disobey this, uh, 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 it is Okot Bitek who is talk, uh, in Song of Lawino talking about this uh, uh, a person whose balls have been crushed in ways that you can no longer recognize them, you know. Uh, and what, what we have done, what colonization has done is to create uh, what one might term epistemic evolues, you know, uh, that we, we have this people, all of us who have become assimilated in this system. We, we are assimilated. So how, how do we return home? Uh, Europe has this big project about reintegration and return migrants. So we are saying that we have migrated and we should return home. How do we return home? And I think that's the challenge. You know, why we have this uh, uh, epistemic uh, a disobedience squad who are doing their work. And I think that's the first step, just disrupt. We need a group of people who first just disrupt, uh, who start off by saying no, you know. And uh, Mignolo and Dabiashi says, it doesn't mean that uh, uh, the epistemologies from Europe are not productive. It's just that uh, it doesn't take care of other ontologies. It's like the law. You know, when I have Roman Dutch law uh, uh, regulating practices, you know, in a place somewhere in my village, in Bafut, in Cameroon, or somewhere here. I'm sorry, it's problematic because what is the law? Why, why, why does the law exist? Why do these regulations uh, exist? They, they, they exist to produce a particular kind of society. And why were they born in particular places? The law was brought in in particular place, places to manage. And it is, especially in colonial societies, to control uh, uh, those movements. Uh, and, uh, we, I, and I think that's what we need to do. This universalism uh, uh, needs to end. We, by doing this noise, pushing this noise to end another kind of noise. Fantastic. Uh, Ernesto, you wanted to comment as well. And then, okay, Ernesto and then Paula afterwards. No, I, I just wanted to add that I was thinking while, while he was talking uh, with the, when uh, Divine was talking about this idea of making noise, as you said, in order to be heard. The extent to which there is something particular about us and these institutions, academic institutions, that unlike other spaces, unions or, or, or uh, other spaces in society, have developed some sort of a capability to absorb and assimilate noise uh, and in some cases to even encourage noise as, as, as part of what we do uh, to the point that it becomes meaningless. Mm. To the point that you know that there's a, a space uh, that defines us as, as, as members of this uh, uh, scholarly world, as people who make noise, and in defining so, uh, be, the impact, the, the, the newness, and, and what moves beyond us, uh, it's, it's, it's very little. And, and I don't know, maybe, maybe one thing, one challenge would be to think, you know, where are the areas in which these uh, skills of academic institutions to absorb and to become our noise meaningless is less 
uh, strong, is, is weaker. And um, I don't know, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, uh, academic institutions in the US, but uh, it's not surprising that the two areas, you can basically make noise about anything and that you take it for granted and it's absorbed and, and becomes to some extent uh, meaningless. The two areas in which uh, making noise is problematic, uh, is still problematic, uh, likely problematic is when you talk about the state of Israel and when you talk about slavery. Those are the two areas in which you make noise in, and you are identified as a problem. Uh, pretty much with everything else, you can see whatever you want and the noise become noiseless in a way. So I don't know, maybe, maybe the idea of, of this, this disobedience needs that, that, that reflection about what is specific about us and about this space, right? I think that's very right. Um, I'll, I'll return to the point of politics, but I wanted to, to uh, hear from uh, Paula as well. Uh, you wanted to comment on my provocation, I hope. Yes, there are a lot of provocations, but I'll start saying that I'm very much in line with when Tammy says that silence is very powerful. I, I did research about women in the nationalist struggle. I'm not talking about armed struggle. I'm talking about liberation struggle. Where were women? And apparently only men have fought. Women apparently were doing something else. And that brought very long silences when I was asking them about these questions until they just told me like, we did what we did all the time. We fed, we share information, we help them. So they were always liberating the society. We just had not the lenses enough organized to grasp their presence. But their silence was overwhelming, inconvenient to me because it was a form of showing that I was totally clueless about their interpretation of their role in fighting for a project that we usually have a certain narrative about it. So that is my first element that I think it's all questions of protest are contextual and we have to analyze them in that context. Otherwise, we tend to go to these universalizing projects that can result in silencing and destroying knowledges and experiences. So that is being, a, 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 as I said, a mismatch between history and anthropology, and I'm always moving from one to the other. I think those, those are elements that are very important to me. So this gets me back to the question of what is universal and universalism. And I think Diagne has a very strong point about this discussion. And I go back to Diagne, to Trujillo and so on. My problem is when a certain project of the world, it doesn't matter whatever it is, if it is the South, Af South African representation of Southern Africa, because I usually say that I belong to ERN, I'm not, I am the other three letters because South Africa, it's a, Southern Africa, it's a bit bigger than Southern, than South Africa. So that question of, for example, thinking that the project of globalization in the Atlantic represents globalization. Those questions have to be brought to the table. What the heck are we talking about? And that's my problem between universal, that is a project of trying to share knowledge with the world. And in that sense, for example, I go back to women. They were absolutely fundamental. Even in, in the violence of slavery, they took knowledge with them. And for me, it's always a problem to explain that recipes, something that we do at home very easily, it's one of the greatest examples of sharing knowledge without provocations. So you see, you can eat Ushua or Ugali or the various translations that we have. It's ba maize based. Maize is from Mexico. So how come we have all this knowledge being shared? I think it's a question of a gender, a certain gender perspective that things happen and they are there. And in that sense, I'm not so much about this question of disobedience because it's a form of producing knowledge of being rebel against a certain normativity, but saying I can do it otherwise. And I think the gender question, gender dimension in that sense is very important. 
because women, I don't know, I'm making a generalization, but they tend to be to do the things first and then to complain. So they go slowly, they change the things, and then at the end, someone is going to theorize about it, but they usually would say like, I did nothing, it was nothing very special. So that is the problem between the universal of the North, the universal project of the North Atlantic, which is a North centric project, I have nothing against it. My problem is when we attempt to explain that the North world is the core of the world and then we become peripheries and we have to cope to, to copy that model and so on and so forth. So that is my problem. And now getting back to question, and I was listening to the questions of Latin America. And I don't know, I, I, I really have always a puzzle to me as an intellectual from Africa, how we are so critical in analyzing our own experiences. We are hypercritical, everything is always wrong. There is, before we find something good, we have to criticize it very deeply. But our colleagues from Latin America, normally they are more balanced in the critical stance and the positive stance. But before saying that, I think we have something very problematic and very rebel in our own world is to refuse to be Lusophones, for example. I'm not a Lusophone person. I speak Portuguese, but I speak other languages. So I refuse that colonial idea that for me is problematic. Now I'm being critical of the Americas, of being called Latin America, that people usually say, you guys, Lusophone, Francophones, no. We have other languages and we think from those languages, as I was saying. So it, it is very colonial to insist that an imperial language still is the one that condenses and controls our way of doing knowledge. And this brings me to two final comments. Universities in Africa are not just more than projects, being it uh, the Humboldtian system or Bonapartian system. We still have, and I'm very happy that Divine is here because that is a global project of Codesia. We have old universities from uh, Timbuktu, from al -Azhar, the oldest university founded, still working, founded by a woman in Fez. So these are things that we have to be proud of and say like, Okay, we have different forms of universities that are modern universities, but there are certain that are made in Europe and the others are not. But even at the level of European knowledge, there are certain things that come from the other side of the Mediterranean. For example, in the universities of Southern Europe, when you get your PhD, they put the hat in your head and you'll see it very much in Coimbra University. They have these weird hats with lots of things. That thing is from the Sufi tradition, because when you get the knowledge, your Sufi master gives you the turban and then you become the master. So that is one, it's a, a, a transmission from Africa to modern universities still in Europe. And we have to grasp that contribution and say, this is what we gave you. Finally, the question of time, that is my, my problem. I think we have different dimensions of time. For instance, uh, the liberation struggle in Mozambique cannot be resumed to the 10 years of armed struggle. There was a, a long durée and that requires a calibration of time to understand where the ruptures are and what are the contributions of all that process that got people to take conscience that they were really exploited, they, their humanity was negated, and they decided to go on into another stage of being not disobedient, but being active rebels. And I think I prefer the question of being rebel because we can be rebel in silence and we can affirm another project without saying words, just saying, no, I'm not going to do it. So I'm going to sit here. And that sort of that Gandhi later on will theorize as passive resistant is indeed an experience from Southern Africa, from South Africa in this case, from Nepal, but it's an experience that it's also again something from the continent and we don't pay attention to it. So it's time to reclaim our contributions to the world, give following what Divine is saying that we need to say, okay, this is also our way of thinking and being in the world.
Thank you very much for a passionate uh, response, uh, Paula. Uh, I promised we would open the floor to the to the audience or to questions that have come in uh, on Zoom, and I do that now. I have a number of questions, but I, I would like to hear from the audience or people on Zoom. Are there any questions on Zoom? No. Are there any questions in the audience? I thought we would take advantage of there actually being an audience here. A rebel silence. A rebel silence. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not sure what it says about us. We've all been rejected now, you know. The bar is really high. Okay, I'll I'll continue with a uh, with another uh, well, perhaps a provocation then. Okay. What COVID nineteen probably has shown us is that uh, the nation state is not dead, nationalism is not dead, uh, provincialism is not dead, power politics is not dead. Um, and I would assume that seeing all these pushes against uh, the academy to speak about one type of institution or critical thought from uh, the nation state, a kind of uh, uh, a nation state on speed now and, and during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And also seeing the push against the academy and critical thought and, and, uh, and the like from uh, the market uh, really makes it even more difficult to perceive, uh, to perceive uh, a kind of uh, a kind of decolonized academy in a sense. Yeah. Uh, what are the options open, you think, for researchers, for those, those of us, the army of, of uh, the, 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 the disobedient, the army of, of the, the ones making noise or staying silent strategically? What are the op uh, options open to sort of engage the kind of in incredibly shrinking space of free thought and free research and, uh, and intellectual engagement within spaces such as the, the academy. Anyone would like to attempt a, a response? To, to, pr to provide an example. The, there is a push, for instance, to provide an example from the provincial north, from Norway. Yeah? There is a push now to, for us in, 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 for instance, curricular development to uh, use more and more Norwegian language text, translated text or text by Norwegian authors. Yeah? And you see the same kind of push by the nation state, by ideas of national canons everywhere, yeah? from populist regimes in, in, in the south and north, to uh, nominal uh, liberal regimes. So how can we how can we work against that? Uh, Divine. Uh, 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 beyond the question is, uh, can we work against it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, can we work against it? And should we work against it? Uh, you know, I, I think we are living through. Uh, very interesting and complicated times. I, I like to use the term entanglement uh, uh, to, to describe many of these things, uh, you know. Uh, in, in, in many places in, or in several places, people have been pushing for nation state. People have been pushing for uh, a very strong nationalist you know, uh, 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 politics and ethos, you know, uh, because the thing for, for years, you know, locals have been neglected, you know, so it is important you have to recenter it. So, so it's interesting. Uh, and uh, it was sold uh, in, in certain places, you know, as the panacea for all of the issues and inequality issues that people were facing. And, and we've seen, especially on this continent, with all of these... Um, uh, xenophobic uh, 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 issues from South Africa down to Ethiopia to Cameroon, Senegal, all of these other countries. And then in Europe, and Europe's push uh, uh, to ensure that people don't cross, you know, the Mediterranean, turning it into the graveyard, you know, of may, uh, many Africans. So, uh, so th this, just before this pandemic, 
these issues were really, really critical. Uh, and then it happens. Uh, and some of the key issues that we've been asking for uh, in, in some countries, borders closed down. I, I, I had the other day uh, uh, politicians in another country pushing and ask, saying that we need to close the borders because so many foreigners are, ask, are coming in. I said, since when were the borders open? Because for the past nine months, <laughs> you know, people haven't been moving. So <laughs> what are you talking about? So I, I, I think that um, what we need to do and what the world has demonstrated in the past uh, weeks, last week I was, in the past months, last week I was listening to this uh, new craze, this video uh, called, this song by uh, this South African artist, uh, Master G, uh, Jerusalem. Uh, and, and people across the world, you know, people who would normally not talk to each other, people who do not even understand what the song is about, people who even do not relate to religion or to Christianity at all, you know, and in a country, South Africa, where uh, there's so much, there's so many distinctions. And in a world where uh, I will give you caterpillar to eat and you tell me that that is really something dirty somewhere else. You have people across the world dancing to this music uh, <laughs> and, 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 and uh, you know, and spreading it through channels. Like, I mean, YouTube, TikTok, and all of these places where we have problems, which demonstrates that there is something that we can actually do, that it is possible for us across the world to connect to something that actually makes us dance, that makes us to become children at a time when all of these national borders have tried to separate us from each other. So it's possible. And that's what academics need to do, uh, to find ways to, con when we talk about the e epistemic disobedience, it's not necessarily because we think that, uh, uh, other epistemologies are problematic. It's just that we have plurality, that we should have conversations, uh, but also that it, we, you know, we don't need interventions every time that we want to have a conversation. If I want to talk to Temi, just let me talk to Temi, you know, let me have a conversation with Temi without necessarily making it a conversation about beyond, you know? Uh, and, and, that, and that is what I think Debashi and Mignolo are dealing with with Zizek when they say, Zizek, what is your problem? We're having a conversation with ourselves. Why do you want to always make it your issue? You know, and it is possible. And I think if we create this space for conversation, if we create this space for breathing, if we bring in these new epistemic ventilators, we're going to allow space for people to be able to breathe. And that is what we are asking for. Nationalism is powerful. Nationalism has always been there, but that is why we exist. So we should continuously challenge the system through our writing, through publishing. I want Beyond to, to write and teach my students. I want to teach Beyond students, you know? Uh, I, th that is transcending these borders. I want be as I've spent my time publishing in Bergen, I, you know, people in Bergen should publish somewhere in Bafut, you know, or publish somewhere in Bali in a place they don't know. So, so that we can transcend these national boundaries and isolate. The only way we can fight this nationalism is to isolate these people, you know, and intellectuals can do it by ensuring that knowledge circulates and that we actually transpose ourselves, even when we are invisible, that we are visible, even when we are silent as, uh, uh, Maria and uh, Temi are saying, silence is disobedient. That is how, I mean, lots of women across the continent, you know, challenge some of these systems just by disobeying the system silently. And, and we can do it through our writing and thinking. Thank you, Divine, for, for, uh, for showing us uh, kind of uh, either shortcuts through or around the nation states. Uh, this is very helpful, at least for me. And you also in a sense, uh, kick-started how I wanted to end this session. And that was uh, how we can uh, reimagine transcontinental research and academic practice, and how we can work practically as researchers, as critical thinkers, as uh, artists, as people wanting to intervene in the public or private sphere. How can we, how can we think about that? So I'll give you a few minutes each to sort of round off 
on that note. And I think we can again start with uh, with uh, Temi. Uh, please. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 loved, I love this new epistemic ventilators. I'm still there thinking about what they are and it's taken me to uh, mycelium networks and, and mushrooms and networking, uh, networking in nature and how that maps onto the way in which we network using different kinds of technologies, which is why when you posed your question, I was thinking, yeah, but you know, people are just getting it together somehow, Snapchat, whichever way, all sorts of media, podcasts, blogs, you know, they are moving, you know, um, Adrienne Marie Brown, she wrote a, a beautiful book, um, a couple of beautiful books, um, but one called Emergent Strategy, and she's talking about the fact that using these uh, ecosystems as a way of thinking about connection and organizing, and you know, she says life moves towards life, and the reality is that, you know, like, no matter what is happening on a structural level, like, people will find each other. Um, if they're magnetized towards it, if we're sending out the right kind of signals and, 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 and good vibrations. I, you know, I was brought up by a musician. So for me, the words resonance and transmission and energy and vibration, for me, they are kind of like part of my, my lexicon. I think that if we, um, if we transmit, if we radiate, if we bring good energy into the classrooms and, and, and our writing, if we write differently, if we use storytelling, if we do all these wonderful creative things um, to kind of help people to, to, to reimagine, to revision, um, to, to, to think themselves beyond. I think that um, we, we already have the tools to do it. So I'm, I'm like excited, on that level, I'm excited because I can see what, you know, people are doing with technology in, in other ways. And I'm like, yeah. And, and there's a whole, well, there's not even an undercommons now, like everyone is using it, but there's a whole, I mean, there's a whole, there's so many libraries, free, quote unquote, library. Okay, this is a legal conversation. But anyway, there are so many free libraries out there that people are just making their own bibliographies, making their own, making their own libraries digitally. So, you know, no, it's all good. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very happy we seem to be work working towards a, a kind of a positive uh, conclusion here. Uh, Paula, what would your uh, thoughts be on how we can work as researchers and how, what transcontinental, transdisciplinary research might be? Uh, how we might conceive it to reflect uh, these uh, these uh, questions about uh, epistemic liberation or epistemic disobedience, as it were. Um, I'm not Catholic, so I don't like the expression disobedience because I don't obey God. <laughs> so that's my problem about being rebel. I'm a rebel against anyone that tries not to understand me, but I I'm not Catholic and I have a problem with all these penitences and everything that still marks the judiciary system. So that's my, my problem with this, uh, the religions of the book. And don't take me there. So that, is, that, that will be another conversation. But uh, um, language, I, I think and I, I, I agree with Divine. We speak different languages. I don't know anyone in the continent that only speak two languages. Everybody speaks three or four. And we always manage after a while to get to the next one. So that is something that we should tell the world, learn languages. Of course, these um, Bologna projects in Europe are very time, very time framed, but that should be something that people need to start from primary school. Uh, I have a grandson who is in primary school now. And the, the other day we were discussing because we want to go uh, Asia. So I was telling him, now you, you should take Mandarin. And I was like, yeah, I was thinking about French. Like, okay, we have French, Portuguese. He speaks uh, to language of Muslim. And I said, okay, now you take Mandarin. I speak Russian and we can go East. But for him, it was normal. So it was not a big question. So that is a question with primary education. In that sense, I think it's a problem. 
of the educational system at the bottom level to introduce other language like Kiswahili that South Africa is introducing now as a free language. Those are means that will allow us to interact in the continent and beyond the continent. So that's my questions about language and challenging. Uh, what I would say that is a problem with our politicians. We have very ignorant politicians that I'll say made in the US, made in France, made in the UK. Uh, we need politicians, as Cabral would say, thinking from their own heads and with the feet very strong in the, in the soil, understanding what people want and not just trying to answer to the outside project. So we need to find another balance. Now getting back to COVID, I never participated in my life in so many seminars. I'm exhausted, <laughs> truly, I'm sorry. I, it has been very interesting, but I, I, the other day I was telling people, when is Zoom going to end? Because I, I, I really enjoy participating in different countries, in the, but it's exhausting because we have to prepare ourselves. It's not just connect and disconnect. It's not switching from Excel to Word. We have to think. So COVID has been very important. It has made me think very much, but also made me reconnect and being part, like today. If it was not for COVID, in the bad sense. So there's always a, a positive side to everything that we have to say. Finally, um, I think we need to start looking at us from a different perspective. Uh, tales, sculptures, paintings, music, food. Uh, COVID was the time of getting home through food. I was so fed up at a certain time when we were closed that I decided to do um, bajiers that are called akara in the other side of Africa and akaraje. So I was talking with a friend in Nigeria saying, how do you do? Because I don't have the beans and she was telling me how to do it. So we managed to reinvent ourselves to cross borders. And I, I totally agree with him in Divine. We need to bring those experiences to the forefront and say we are not just talking about academic knowledge, we are talking about knowledge. And the kitchen of all these women, because I have to tell the story, she was cooking in the kitchen and I was here in Coimbra watching how to prepare a cara. And then she was supervising me, it was a kind of strange, but it worked. So if we did it, how can't we expand this connections and these forms of inter-knowledge that we are producing. And, and that were, were my very positive experiences of COVID. Very good, thank you. Uh, Ernesto? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm sorry I hate being the last. No, you're and, not the last. Divine will have. Oh, that's one, great. One. Oh, that's, that's good. Uh, because I'm, I'm probably less, <clears throat> less optimistic, uh, mostly in, 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 in looking at this specific uh, days after uh, or during the pandemic. Uh, I guess uh, both of the story, but in general, I'm, I'm cautious about nationalism, but also about uh, the many different uh, forces against it. Uh, and I think the, the legacies or the conclusion that we can get from what's going on now uh, are not only those related to the problem of the rise of nationalism as a problem or as a threat uh, and maybe can be a, a moment in which we can see how one of the specific expressions or, 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 or um, of, of nationalism which is the nation and, and thing government have had uh, have made the impact of this pandemic so different across the globe in in the three uh, places that's anecdotal evidence, of course, that I uh, in which I live, uh, I couldn't see anything more relevant to discuss if people are alive or dead, if people are uh, hungry or not, than the government. I see Norway, where <clears throat> most of the impact, uh, both in terms of the pandemic and in terms of economic effects of the pandemic, have been minimal. And had to do a lot <clears throat> with the still available resources of the Norwegian state and the revenues it gets from uh, its exports. <laughs> um, 
you can see, I can see Argentina, uh, uh, where a progressive government uh, tried a massive uh, economic plan with one specific object, which was to put food on the table of people uh, and expect uh, to have, for this specific emergency plan, uh, three million people applying to it, uh, deploy all the resources available and more. And in the first week had nine million people apply for that, uh, a government, a nation that doesn't even know uh, what it has below, or even worse, that doesn't know what, what some specific things and knows too much about other things, uh, and the United States, where the same forces that are feeding nationalism are the forces that dismantle the nation. These people going in the, on the streets uh, asking to open in, uh, to finish the lockdown, opening the economy, uh, are to some extent, and I don't agree with them in, in almost anything, uh, are opting between dead and death. It's what they learned, is the, the historical, social, and political experience of not having anything uh, behind. Uh, it's the realization, you know, the, remember the, the famous uh, quote by Margaret Thatcher, there's not such a thing as society, there's just men and women uh, doing their things. Uh, they are the actual realization of that, of that moment. Uh, so, and, and, and those are the nationalists, supposedly. So I, I, I think it's also a moment to see the manifold ways in which nationalism, but also anti-nationalism uh, can, can play uh, different roles in, in moments like this. Thank you. Sorry not to be optimistic. A <laughs> stark reminder of the world we live in. Uh, Divine, do you want to add one minute, uh, a one minute kind of conclusion to our conversation before we, uh, we have to end? I'll be very quick uh, while thanking you for allowing, uh, enabling us uh, to have this conversation. But I, 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 I would say that uh, what has, I think, been uh, very revealing and very productive is, is to take feminism and feminist work seriously. Uh, uh, and I think if we, if we want to liberate ourselves, if we want to imagine a new space and a new work, we have to take feminism and feminist work more seriously. And also just stop seeing it as uh, problematic noise. We have to take it as serious noise because it's a theory of society and uh, it's a theory of how we uh, inhabit and cohabit uh, a, a space. Uh, and uh, if we look at uh, the work of black feminists, the work of African feminists, uh, I think it provides us already with the answers that uh, we need. And if you look at the spaces where this kind of knowledge liberation is taking uh, place, it is feminist work that has enabled that. Uh, and unless we turn to that, uh, we will continue to cycle in the same space. Thanks a lot to all panelists. We are running a bit late, but I have certainly learned an enormous amount. I've both been quite, uh, become quite optimistic and I've become quite depressed or uh, tuned into the world again. So I've learned a lot about academic knowledge needing to uh, needing to extend beyond the academy i've learned that language is important i've learned that creativity food art is important and i've learned that we need to circumvent uh, the institutions that are in front of us that impede uh, a path towards decolonizing the academy and also epistemic liberation so thank you to all participants and thank you to the silent and thereby disobedient audience and the silent and thereby disobedient digital followers. So thank you. Thank you.